Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome to this welcome to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard. Folks, mm-hmm. folks I, I hope you're staying cool because as, as one would say, we're probably in the best part of the country that one could, could, could want, if you will, here in the Pacific Northwest, because people up in the South and the East are just suffering for days. And so I'm sure if you have loved ones down there, I'm sure you, you have some feel for that piece of it. But anyway, but what we're going to do today is that um, we're going we're gonna to try to give you some sense of what's going on in Congress. Many of you, in all due respect, are not really paying attention to the news. You don't read the newspaper. You don't look at the news aspect of it, but we're in a very serious situation. We're in a flux right now. And so what I'm going to do this hour is that I've got someone here with me who's got some, who's got good background, who's been in, been in politics and public, in fact, he's been in, in public service for a number of years. I say public service uh, as opposed to politics and a number of things and whatever. He's, been, he's a business person, a business person and whatever, and, uh, and he's been on this show a number of times. And I've only, I only call him when there's a need to educate, if you will, the public, okay? So uh, my guest today is, is, is Senator Rod Monroe. Senator, how you doing? Well, Bruce, I'm doing great. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me in these troubled times that yes, our nation is yes, facing. Yes, yes, yes. Um, my background as an educator, uh, particularly as a teacher of economics and, and American history, mm-hmm. tells me that these are unprecedented times. Mm-hmm. Never before in the history of the United States have we threatened not to pay our bills. And I don't think the people really understand the ramifications of us defaulting and not paying our bills. Okay, let's, 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 just, let's just do a, 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 a simple, uh, uh, let's say, definition of not paying one's bill, maybe using a credit card or whatever. Can you just go through that and then we'll just jump right in. What, what, how, well, how, would you, how would you categorize Well, that? if you or I didn't pay our bills for right. a while, we would go into bankruptcy. Yes. And that would mean that our credit rate rating would be terrible. If we ever wanted to buy a house again, or a car, or even rent an apartment, our credit rating would say no, uh, and we'd be in a lot of trouble. Now, the same thing really is true of the United States. Uh, we have a triple A credit rating. That's the highest, the best, the strongest credit rating in the world. And what that means is that we can borrow money we can sell our bonds to China or to Japan or to wealthy people in the United States at the best possible interest rate. And that means that taxpayers who have to pay the interest on our national debt pay at a lower interest rate. Now, if we lose that bond rating, and if we default, believe me, we will lose that bond rating, that means that interest rates will go up, that all the bonds that we sell to continue to, f- to fund our national debt will be at a higher interest rate. That means taxes will be higher on everybody to pay that. That means that uh, interest rates that you or I pay on our home mortgage, uh, which are tied to the, the national interest rates, and most of those mortgages are, that, rate will, that interest rate will go up as well. Uh, defaulting really will tax every person in this country in some way or the other. Uh, either through higher interest rates or through uh, higher uh, tax costs to pay for the interest on the national debt. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, you know, as, I, as we think about this piece, again, from the government standpoint, it's just like a business, just like anybody else not being, as you say. But for years, uh, it has been said that uh, uh, they have been collecting less than what they have been paying, what, what they've been buying, if you will, or paying out, right? Fair, something like that? You're absolutely right. Deficit spending has been going on, especially severely in the last decade. Now, when Clinton was president, we were getting a handle on it. In the last few years that Clinton was president, we were actually in the black. Okay. We were actually reducing the national debt, paying it down. But in the last 10 years, eight years of baby Bush, and now two years under Obama, mm-hmm. we have been dramatically spending more than we take in. Uh, and that means that the national debt during that decade has doubled. 
Well, I guess when I, when you, you said that last ten years, and like you said, you had that first eight years, and then all of a sudden the Obama administration picked up the pick up the tab, if you will, by being being president. We had high unemployment, and we had, we had a lot of folks were not working, right? Businesses were hurting times. All of a sudden, they come with the stimulus and things of that nature. When the economy goes in the toilet, okay, somebody has to do something, you know, and. Unemployment rates go up. Right. Historically, whether it be under Franklin Roosevelt or whoever, historically, under Keynesian economics, mm -hmm. you spend a bit more to create more jobs to get the economy, they call it pump priming, okay. get the economy started again okay. Okay. so that it will then generate the private sector jobs that are necessary. Uh, and that was happening uh, initially under the Obama administration with the okay. stimulus package. Okay. But of course now, He's being forced to cut back and cut back and cut back. So what you're seeing now is an increase in private sector jobs, but a subsequent and almost identical reduction in public sector jobs, teachers, firefighters, blue collar stuff, blue people, people mm. that construct highways mm -hmm. and build mm. bridges, mm. and all of those kinds of programs are being cut back on to try and bring about a balanced budget. That's kind of scary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, and, and from a layman standpoint, I was, I've always looked at from the standpoint of taxes like paying rent. Everybody has to pay rent. Yeah. Fair? Yeah. Right? And if people are not paying rent, guess who has to pick up the tab? Yeah, you and me. <laughs> well, look, let, let's talk about, um, uh, again, this state, for instance, has been a sort of a, we've, we've always had a balanced, sort of a, a, a balanced budget, if you will. Is that part of the legislative? Well, plan? I've been in the legislature, served in the legislature for 18 years. I served okay. 12 years on the Metro Council. Uh, so I've been in government since 1977. Okay. Uh, and the state of Oregon, under our constitution, is required to have a balanced budget. How far back does that go? It goes back to 1859, 1859. when we became a state. Okay. The original constitution. And so we came to Salem last February with the very difficult task of having to cut over three billion dollars in order to just maintain a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. That meant that we had to reduce uh, school spending, we had to reduce human service spending, we had to reduce all of the salaries of government, everything got frozen or cut. All of the people that work for the state, uh, my staff, my own salary, all got either frozen or cut mm -hmm. in order to try and, and plug that hole. But you know what was different? We worked together mm -hmm. with the leaders of the Senate and the House and the governor, uh, Republicans and Democrats, and the Oregon legislature split almost evenly mm -hmm. between Republicans and Democrats. We worked together to get that job done in as fair a way as possible without raising taxes, mm -hmm. and we did it. Uh, and I give a lot of the credit to the governor because he really stepped up and he was there all the time. Previous governors that I've served with uh, rarely would come into a caucus meeting, uh, either a Democrat or a Republican caucus meeting. This governor, John Kitzhaber, was there weekly, all the time. He was in talking to us. What do you need? How can I help you? Um, and I think that was really a remarkable job. But more than that, uh, Senate President Peter Courtney okay. is an outstanding yeah, public he's servant. There, yes. yeah. He's a veteran. Yeah, yes, he is, you know? big time. Yes. I like those yes, old guys that are about yes. my age. See, I figured that's a little <laughs> yeah, wisdom going to the gray hair. Yes, yes, see? Yes, yes. And Peter Courtney, just every time it looked like things were falling apart, he would call Republicans and Democrats and the governor into his office and he would work things out. He'd put together a compromise that made sense. And then he'd go out and round up the votes, and sometimes I had to help round up those votes mm -hmm. to make sure they had the votes to pass. We did that with education reform, and we certainly did that with the reforms to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. um, and when it, in May, we had, had the budget pretty well figured out, and we came to May and found out the revenue forecast was actually up a little bit. Not a whole lot. Out of a $15 billion budget, it was up about $125 million. Mm -hmm. but we decided how to allocate that additional money, and most of it went to human resource needs because that's what had been cut most dramatically. But we also put a little bit more into education as well. Um, and again, uh, balancing the state budget is difficult, 
we're forced to do it by the law. Mm -hmm. Federal government isn't. Mm -hmm. They can go on the credit card, mm -hmm. and they've done that too long. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been mean, here this thing about the rainy day fund. It's kind of like, was there any little surplus cash uh, that you guys were able to work with during that time? We had a little bit of a rainy day fund that okay. helped some. Okay. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. We need to reform our tax system and create a substantial, at least a $2 billion rainy day fund. Mm -hmm. I think we ought to use... Um, some of the kicker money for that um, instead of auto automatically kicking it back. I think we ought to also tap our regular uh, general fund revenue a certain percentage any years when it's up a bit. Obviously, if you're in a deep hole, that's not the time you save. Mm -hmm. You save when you have a little extra mm -hmm. and then you use that to fill the hole when you go into a deep hole. Mm -hmm. That's what we ought to be doing. Okay. Uh, we did that to some extent. We had some excess revenues that we were able to use, but not near enough. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about the varying agency, or when you think about government, people think about government, it is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. The electorate is the one that basically represents us, right? The people as a whole, right? And then they, you have your staff. They decided to keep me working. I, I, I was reelected last I, year. I, I noticed that. That was uh, good. You know, it was either me or some younger guy. <laughs> now, you know, the other thing that I, I hear you saying as you, as you were going through this, uh, this uh, explanation of how you balance the budget and whatever you you basically went to various entities and says okay fine you're not going to get as much money this time around as you got last time around but you didn't fire anybody because in all due respect if you if you lay people off right. they're going to be unemployment right. so in essence you, you end up yeah. basically in the same boat right did you fire folks or did you no. basically keep them on we didn't fire anybody okay. now some school districts are because okay state funding for school to school districts has been reduced and some school districts are actually laying people off the state though instead of laying anybody off uh, froze salaries reduced salaries in some instances and then took um, layoff days you know just uh, a certain number of days that you would not get paid uh, and that could be anywhere from 10 days a year to maybe as much as 17 days a year. So in essence, it was a salary reduction, but you still had a job. Okay. Um, and then, of course, we had to look at benefits, uh, medical, uh, pension benefits, and so on. And we made some reductions under the governor's leadership in benefits to state employees. Okay. Um, again, Businesses are doing it, it makes sense, yeah. and uh, so curbing benefits so that a person that's working in a government job maybe pays 10% mm -hmm. of their health care costs and the state pays 90%, whereas before the state was paying 100%. Mm -hmm. okay. um, that's the kind of thing that's being done in the private industry, mm -hmm. and so we just thought it was fair to do that at the state level as well. Okay. When, when one starts thinking about the IE people paying rent, IE taxing, paying your taxes yeah. and whatever, uh, are we pretty fair here in this state where, where everybody's paying their fair share? Oh. Are we paying that? Everybody's paying their fair share? Well, what do you think about fair that? Fair is in the high of the beholder. <laughs> Oregon's tax system um, really needs some work. The problem with Oregon's tax system is that it relies almost entirely on personal and corporate income taxes. Mm. We have no consumption tax, no sales tax at all in this state, and that's the way the Oregonians like it. But also, we have greatly limited property tax revenues uh, for local governments. And so some local governments, not in this county, but in some of the southern counties that used to be timber reliant, mm -hmm. have found that these property tax limitation measures that say you cannot have any more property taxes, even though what you're paying is the lowest in the state. In some of those counties it is, the lowest in the state. You can't raise it, even if the voters want to, you can't raise it. And by the way, your timber revenues are going away and the federal government's gonna quit making up the difference. Um, though I really feel for counties like Coos County and Curry County and Jackson County and Josephine County mm -hmm. um, and some of the Eastern Oregon counties as well, they're hurting a lot worse than Multnomah County. They're having to lay off their uh, their police, their sheriff's office mm -hmm. folks, they're having to close their libraries. Uh, so there's some real problems, finance problems in the state, and it's not just with Salem, it's with local governments as well. Um, and some kind of reform really is, is needed. Mm -hmm. You know, again, from a layman's standpoint, when one thinks about government, a lot of times they say, gee, this is big government, we're spending so much money, whatever. 
but uh, wouldn't you say that the true definition of government is is services that are a need that i.e. that that a private entity can't provide?